te voy a ver. Hello. How are you, eh? Ja, jag ska leva kommen till hela uh, PhD värde ju Runo Priti Isfeld. Värskatlan är framt i samstäver med den Fråskapset Färja och Aalborg universitet. Eh och heter jag Värskatlan är Marriage Migrants to the Faroe Islands: An Analysis of the Life World of Non-Western Women Married to the Faroe to the Faroe Islands. Vi lägger Värskatlan har vare Helene Priset Nilsen lektor i Aalborg universitet och Jester Hågård lektor i Fråskapset Färja. Och Och i domsnämnt ni sitter Firus Gaini, Farmauer, lektare av Fråskapsrådet Färja. Maj Camilla Munkegjord, granskiga professor vid Norse Norwegian Research Center AS. Och Steven Arnfjord, lektare vid Elisima Tusarvik. Värjan fär fram av Enskon och tar vi Firus Gaini, Farmauer i mätingarnämnden som lejer Värjuna. Och skrajen är att lej så lejs. Um, fyrst kommer Firus och greier fra om uh, arbeidet som heter nevnt ned. Og etter dette får Runa høve til å legge frem sine verskatlene. Og det hever om 45 minutter til. Etter dette kommer første opponenter som er meg, Camilla Munkegjord. Hun har 40 minutter til å sette PD-evnene om spørninger. Og så har vi den steg opp på omleier 20 minutter. Og da er det således at hvis det er folk i salen noen som ikke setter spørninger i ex-auditorium, så har de et høve ta til at si av formannen noen, før de skal inn ifra, at de tar en spørning, og så vil han tidse en bank etter stedsjen. Og til å sette ca. 20 minutter av til møvelet ex-auditorium spørninger. Etter dette så kommer andre opponenter, som er Steven Einfjord, han får sin fjør minutter, og at enda kommer formlæreren før vi skal inn i og rundt der av, og her vil vi skal kjøre om noe til å sette evnene og spørninger. Så det er skrajen, og jeg får vi her sånn å gjøre året til før vi skal inn i formlæreren. Takk for det. Takk for det. Ja, som rektoren sier, så er det... Ja, det er verdien av enskånd, så jeg får skifte over til X nå. Jeg har hatt den pleasure av å være the head of the assessment committee. Og jeg kan si, på grunn av the committee, at jeg tror vi hadde en veldig god og fruitful cooperation. The committee startet sitt work on the 11th of April. And uh, we had our meetings through Skype, telephone, emails to discuss the project. And uh, we submitted a preliminary written recommendation um, within the deadline in the end of May and uh, recommended that uh, the PhD thesis would be accepted for defense. And uh, now I will just read the short conclusion of our uh, assessment report. The committee finds that the candidate, Runa Priti Isfeld, presents a captivating analysis of the experiences of non-Western female marriage migrants settled in a rural island community. In general, the thesis is well written and clearly structured. Lessons may be learned both from the analysis of the social challenges the women meet, as well, uh, as, well uh, as the analysis of the often untapped resources these migrants represent. The thesis illustrates 
how encountering otherness and difference in newcomers, in this case marriage migrants from non-Western societies, may incite cultural resistance. Uh, this thesis clearly represents a contribution to research matching the internationally required level for a PhD. On the basis of above assessment, the Evaluation Committee unanimously recommends that the PhD thesis is accepted for defense. So, then I think it's time to give um, Runa Priti Isfeld the floor. Please, Runa. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see that so many of you meet up today, and thank you for the PhD committee for being here as well. Um, first of all, I'm going to have a presentation of my own findings, the um, background for my PhD, and I have decided to focus on the methodological part and findings for this for, for 40 minutes, and then for 15 minutes I will answer the question assessed to me by the PhD committee. I will first of all start this presentation uh, with a quotation. This is a woman that I call Anna, and I wanted with this quotation I wanted to show I want to show you what kind of interviews I have had. And she says, Faroese people should be more open and make foreigners feel more welcome here and understand that we are also normal and not different from them. They should not look down on us because we are human as well. I do understand that having foreigners here is very new to Faroese people, but they need to get used to it and give us respect and not stigmatize us as aliens, and most importantly, not look down on us. Even though there has been an increase in marriage migration to the Faroe Islands, these marriages are to some degree stereotyped. The discourses revolving around these couples are sometimes biased and stereotyped, with some other women being referred to as male order brides or both women on the internet. With the main objective presented as wanting, as wanting to attain a certain economic standard or using Faroese man economically. Their characters and their choice to marry a Faroese man are reduced to economic incentives. Likewise, Faroese men involved in intercultural marriages find themselves stereotyped as bachelors, which is called gamaljongi in Faroe Islands, where the narratives are meant to be a joke, but end up causing stereotyping. These men are perceived as being in need of a foreign wife to replace the role of the mothers and take care of their needs. They are also perceived as not attractive to Faroese women, and due to this, the discourses around Faroese men in intercultural marriages is quite biased. There are certain pre-constructions and pre-discourses among Faroese people about who these women are and what their characters are as women. They are often essentialized as being docile, traditional and good caretakers for their husband and in need of a man to save them. Migrant women have a significant role in Faroese society. They become the wives of local men who would, in many cases, have remained single due to their demographic deficit of women in the islands. Furthermore, as women, they are contributing to securing the intergenerational reproduction of the population. They are, to an extent, becoming mothers of our nation. However, they are often perceived as victims of domestic violence or marrying men who will dominate them. The gender performances are reduced to the image of them as traditional and non-liberated women due to their countries of origin. 
Furthermore, these women are sometimes met with skepticism from the in-law's side, with the husband-to-be often advised to draw up a prenuptial agreement in case the woman marrying him, though in case the woman is marrying him for only economic reasons. In other words, the characters and motives as women are being questioned. Additionally, their culture and way of living are also othered by some of the in-laws and other locals, according to evidences collected during my interviews. Another side effect of migration is the downward or upward social mobility often experienced by marriage migrants in the islands. They have experienced upward mobility by leaving the country, the home country, to marry into the richer north. But at the same time, there are some consequences for their choices. They often experience downward mobility, which means that the human capital is not recognized. This leads to de-skilling or marginalizations on the labor market, where migrants are obliged, are obliged to take on unskilled work. Such downward social mobility is likely to affect the women's identity as they are othered and marginalized in wider society. As women, they find coping strategies to make sense to the new situation in order to make things work in the private sphere. The women's agency and rational choices are often not taken into consideration because they are originally from poorer countries than the Faroe Islands. Their agency is diminished to that of victims of globalization. Thus, economic incentives and a better life are considered, to, are considered the main reason why they sold themselves as women to marry a foreigner. The simplistic and one-dimensional description and stereotyping of these women leads to the danger of marginalization, leaving them without agency in which a biased relationship of who they are as women is constructed. The aim of this dissertation is to escape from the essentialization and homogenization of marriage migrants in the Faroe Islands. Therefore, the question guiding my PhD dissertation is, how has marriage migration influenced and shaped the lives of migrant women marrying into the Faroe Islands? Through this formulation of my research question, the thesis will examine and discuss these women's experiences and perception of themselves as women. And I will reflect upon the experiences with othering and stereotyping. Furthermore, I analyze and discuss how marriage migration has changed their lives at both the private and societal levels. I have chosen to answer this question by dividing my analysis into three chapters, and within each chapter I will analyze and discuss different themes. In the first chapter of the analysis, I focus on the woman's choice and agency, and why they choose to marry a Faroese partner. In the second chapter, I discuss the family relationships and social relations in the Faroe Islands. The third part is about the experiences in the wider society and how they have repositioned themselves as women in the Faroese society. Methodology, methodology and methods. The question is, how do we, as researchers, construct knowledge to enable a better understanding of the other? In this case, migrant women. It is of great importance to reflect upon the methodology used during the construction of new knowledges. The aim of this thesis is to move away from the construction of migrant women as subject and the representation of them as women by reproducing hegemonic discourses which appear to be uncritically constructed. I try, as a researcher, to move away from what Chandra Mohanty identifies as the analysis trap, which constructs and produces third world women as a monolithic group. What I am trying to uncover in this thesis is how 
ethnocentric universalism is insurgent analysis creates the other woman, which leads to uncritical analysis and the construction of the hegemonic first world, third world women. To move away from the simplification of analysis, an intersectional approach is taken into consideration, whether women's background, religion, race, education, etc., are taken into consideration. As a means to escape the analysis trap, situated knowledge is applied. Situated knowledge is an awareness about the production of knowledge and the location of its production and construction. I am very much aware of I am not producing knowledge of the women, of the migrant women within their own field. But as a researcher, I will try to understand their reality by asking them about their life trajectories, backgrounds, and cultural understanding of gender, marriage, and why, as women, they choose migration. Moreover, reflexivity and my own positionality as a researcher on the field is important when conducting research. Reflexivity is the awareness of the researcher's role in practicing research and the awareness of how he or she and the object studied mutually influence each other and the research. Therefore, when conducting qualitative research and interviews, it is important to approach both the object being researched and the field reflexively. Such an approach will make us take into consideration the fact that we, as researchers, have to be aware of the respondent's position as reflective individuals. Reflexivity during data collection and interpretation is important because it is through reflection that the researchers become aware of what he or she is seeing, as well as what inhibits their seeing. This means how I present myself in the field and how I reflect upon my position are crucial for my data collection. As a researcher, a woman, a foreigner in a cross-border relationship, I have to reflect upon my position in the field. Russell and Kelly says that good research questions spring from a researcher's value, passion and preoccupation. At the same time, I must not let my own experiences control the fieldwork and my relationships with the interviewees. This is called being an insider in the field. The insider researcher has to gather data in the field with his or her eyes, wide, her eyes open, but at the same time as though he or she knows nothing about the field or phenomenon studied. In other words, as a researcher, I have to think about my own position on the field and my role among the respondents and not let my own experiences control the interview. I will now move forward to the first chapter of my analysis, which is called The Women as Agents. This chapter will try to answer the question of self-conception, that is, what do migrant women think of themselves, and how do they experience stereotyping. I also analyze the reason why my respondents choose to marry to the Faroe Islands and shed some lights upon how they met their partner and their experiences with when they first moved to the islands. Furthermore, I discuss the expectations of the Faroe Islands as place and the experiences and expectation of marrying a Faroese man. And the findings are, there are several reasons to why my respondents have actively searched for a Western partner to marry. First of all, they have developed an image of Europe and Euro European men, and telling that European men will make better husbands than men in their home country. Furthermore, they expect that the opportunities for them as women in Europe will be better than in their home country. Secondly, as most of my respondents are women with a college or university degree or other kind of vocational qualification, they do not find the gender role system in their home country attractive. As they mentioned, there are different gender systems for men and women, within which men are allowed where men are allowed to practice hegemonic masculinity, while women have to live up to specific gender roles. Due to this, these women do not 
fine man or gender hierarchy of the home country attractive. These women are using marriage migration as, an, as a mean to escape and resist certain traditional gender expectations. Thirdly, divorced women with children are perceived as damaged goods and stigmatized on the marriage market in the home country. Three of my respondents were divorcees with children before arriving in the Faroe Islands, which means they were not attractive to the local man in the home country. These women are sometimes stigmatized in the home country because religion and what is acceptable to society for man and woman differs. This leads to some women actively looking for a partner abroad to marry and act as fathers to the children. The concept of structure and agency can be discussed here, as gender is performed, influenced and constituted for certain structures. Even if gender can be discussed from a phenomenological perspective, it is also constituted and kept alive by specific social structures within the territory, where a certain social structure keeps specific gender relations alive. These women as agents desire to move away from the socially accepted gender structure in their home country to find new social structures where they are where they can choose new or, com or combine gender performances. By choosing my marriage migration, my respondents as agents are attaining the desire for gender equality in their private lives, but are also limited with certain spheres due to structure in the receiving country. The choice to marry, to migrate, to marry a Western partner, to move to the Faroe Islands, does have some negative or biased consequences. This is due to the economic and power relations between the North and the South. Their womanhood is often essentialized and homogenized, even though they have different ethnic and cultural backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, and different, different class backgrounds in the country of origin. These intersectional differences among the women I have interviewed seem to be commonly glossed over or forgotten in situations where they are stereotyped. I will say that race, skin color, and country of origin do have an influence upon the categorization or stereotyping of these women. This is clearly a constitution of hierarchy where gender, race, and country of origin intersects. When we analyze when we analyze the narratives of my respondents. These women are perceived as the other because the skin color and country of origin defines how they are supposed to be. The individualistic gender relation which are found in the Western European country are not what they are attached, attracted to. However, they think that the relationship between a man and a woman has to be equal and the man has to take responsibility for the family and be a leader, as one of my respondents mentioned. Gender equality is a quite complex discussion when it involves couples from different parts of the world. One has to ask, what are the markers used to define gender equality within the private sphere? Is it traditionalism versus modernism, or patriarchy versus equality, or among the markers used to define gender equality? I would say that these women are combining what we call traditionalism gender roles and modern European gender roles. I will move forward with chapter six, the second chapter of my analysis, which is called Family Inclusion and Socialization. In this chapter, I made an analysis of the negotiations between four couples, family inclusion and socialization. And I analyzed marriage ideologies, their relationships with the in-laws, and their social relationships in the Faroe Islands. A consequence of migration is the loss of social ties, which may lead, leave the migrant feeling lost and alone. Even though my respondents are already included in a Faroese family, they will have to re-socialize and re-internalize new norms in order to understand the cultural code of the locals. Marriage as a transaction consists of negotiations and expectations. 
Furthermore, I will make the assertion that due to being from two different countries and cultures in a cross-border marriage, couples have to negotiate and understand each other's culture and new ways of living have to be negotiated. And some of my res participants, respondents, feel that the marriage is being stigmatized by society. And I have three quotations from three different interviews. And one of them said, stigmatization of my marriage is something I experience quite often. Some, women, some people look down on my marriage and think I'm here due to money, and that I am poor and needed a man to save me. Another woman added, I feel strong stigmatization among my in-laws. I see myself as a strong and independent woman who can afford my own things, such as expensive bags and clothes, etc. I have experienced people asking me, how can I afford these brands, thinking that I am using my husband's money to buy expensive things. And another woman added, the negotiation with an inter intercultural couple, marriages are difficult as you will have to negotiate a lot to understand each other and moreover, to understand each other's cultural code. And the findings for the chap this chapter are, firstly, the women talked about the expectation they had when marrying a Western man. The respondent have created what I call the white male syndrome a positive stereotyping and construction of Western men being better carers, lovers, and providers for them as women, whereas men from the home countries as, are reduced to being aggressive cheaters and not respecting them as women. Secondly, when migrating, these women are, are confronted with cultural differences and codes, both in their marriage and in society. Most of them got married soon after meeting each other due to distance, cost, and visa issues. Because of this, the process of getting to know each other occurs during the marriage. Cultural differences may be a challenge as they have to negotiate new ways of living and learn to understand new norms and cultural codes. Their identity may be challenged through the process of inclusion and they are not, as they are not embedded into the norms of the receiving country. Being strangers in the receiving country, migrant women have the opportunity to choose their own identity and gender roles by combining identities and gender performances from their home country and the receiving country. Thirdly, the couple interviews reveal complex dynamics and gender expectations among four different couples. Their incentives to engage themselves in marriage migration differs depending upon the intersection of age, background, whether they live in the Faroe Islands, upbringing, and religion. Changes and continuities in gender relations are quite complex because the women's identities are entangled in a transnational habitus, where they are used to different structures and gender norms in their home country. How the habitus displays itself lies within daily habits and routines. In some cases, there are continuities in the gendered habitus, whereby the migrant practices a transnational habitus. In other cases, the, mig the migrant have to display and combine repertoires in order to accept, to adapt to the new life sphere. The third chapter of my analysis is what I call Making Sense of Nonsense, an experience with social mobility. Upward and downward social mobility is quite common for migrants from non-Western countries, moving to European countries. My respondents have mixed experiences with downward and upward social mobility in relation to the labor market in the Faroe Islands and social status in the home country. Out of the 21 interviews I have conducted, 17 of the respondents had a university degree or vocational education background. The last sphere completely changed and some of them feel that they have, that they are, they have stagnated in the islands. I have three um, quotations from three different interviews as well here. 
Uh, one of them said, I don't feel appreciated here by the government, and I feel bad as so many people look down on us. Some people think that we're here, that we're not educated, and we can't do anything else than cleaning jobs or unqualified jobs. Sometimes I want to scream at these people to let them know that I'm a well-educated woman and that I would be doing a better job than them if I was given the chance in my home country. Another one added, uh, the language is a barrier, and I had to apply as a cleaning lady because, they don't, because you don't need to know the language as a cleaner. In my home country, a cleaning lady is the lowest in society. My family does not know what I'm doing here. This is the reason why I have not invite them, invited them here yet. In this chapter, I analyzed how the respondents tried to make sense of their new lives in the Faroe Islands in relation to wider society, specifically vis-à-vis -vis the labor market. First of all, these women find, have to find coping strategies and incentives to accept downward mobility on the labor market. One of their coping strategies is to acknowledge that the wage are much higher in the Faroe Islands doing an unskilled job than working within their own field in their home country. They are forced to activate the embodied capital to do unqualified jobs, which is a complete change from what they were used to. Secondly, as they are making more money in an unqualified job, this creates an incentive and compensation for them as women, as they can perform their duties as daughters and send remittances home to their families. Family expectations and the shame were too hard for some of the respondents to face, and therefore, some of them chose not to allow the family to visit them in the new home country, or to choose not to inform their family about their working conditions. Some of, some of their family members find it hard to accept the downward social mobility of their daughters, as they had expected them to have a better life when migrated to Europe. Fourthly, those who migrated to the islands at a young age and without a degree found themselves on an advantageous ground. They learned the language quickly and went back to college and can now have a qualified job. The life journeys are quite different from well-educated women. The structures in their case were not a, was not a hindrance because they were gaining new opportunities with the, which they would not have had if they had not migrated. From an intersectional point of view, age at which they migrated, background and education are assets defining and, accept and affecting the social mobility of the woman. Furthermore, the younger they were when they migrated, the easier it was to learn the language and also those who did not have a degree prior to migration found themselves climbing the social ladder sooner than those with a degree. They saw the field as an opportunity to learn new things rather than a constraint. They were able to transform their human capital and climb the social ladder in terms of education, work and wages. Fifthly, Choosing family life and child rearing is one of the coping strategies of the woman to remake sense out of nonsense. They discussed the fact that they have time to focus upon family life and be present in the children's lives. The dichotomy of downward and upward social mobility is quite complex concerning the labor market, wages and social status. Even though these women are on the lowest wage strata in the Faroe Islands, they find themselves satisfied with a better life. The coping strategies and the incentive of believing that they are earning more money is an illusion in a Faroe Islands context, as they are in low-paid jobs, cannot compete as equal on the labor market, and they are in a disadvantageous group if they get a divorce. In this case, I will, say, I will say that the utopia of being, econom of being economically liberated is, re is relative to the fact that they are able to send remittances which are of high value in their home country. But at the same time, they find themselves on the lowest wage strata, 
where they are economically not liberated as women. Gender equality on the labor market and wages are failing as the structures discriminate against migrant women because the majority of them are forced into a marginalized position. The structures are enforcing, reinforcing the dichotomy of us and them on the labor market, making because they are not given the opportunity to compete as equal with native fairways. The system and structures are creating a wedge and a class distinction between locals and migrants, resulting in a situation of A and B citizens. The consequences of this can furthermore create what I call a gendered-related new poor, where migrant women who are marginalized on the labor market are economically dependent upon their partners. And if they need a divorce, they could be impeded due to economic dependency, which may force them to stay in the marriage. And this is a disempowerment for them as women. This dissertation has shown that the stereotyping of these women is based on a biased construction and understanding of the third world and first world women. The women I interviewed has positioned themselves as active agents in order to create the life they desired. And by choosing migra marriage migration, they have experienced both positive and negative consequences in the host country. The simplified typology of marrying up or marrying down does not apply to the women whose experiences are discussed in this dissertation. The typology creates a dichotomy of poor and rich, us and them, while the socio-economic aspects, educational levels, background, etc. of the women and men involved are not taken into consideration. Instead, the geography of global hypergamy is a criterion for explaining marriage migration between third world and first world men. Labeling the patterns of these marriages leaves out the complexities and stigmatizes the third world women as marrying up. Uh, I will now proceed to the question assessed to me by, by the committee. And uh, the question was addressing structural and cultural challenges in the inclusion of non-Western female migrants to the Faroe Islands. Please use concepts and findings from research on female migration to other rural communities in the, in the Western world to conceptualize your findings. So I will say that there are loads of similarities uh, among, uh, uh, with my own uh, research and research done in rural areas in Europe. And I have, spe I have specially focused upon um, rural areas in North Norway, which uh, you asked, uh, which I was given to you, the text that I was given to was specially in North Norway. So I would say that the similarities between uh, those women are quite striking. And um, it's, there's also a, a rise in marriage migration there in, um, f from women, uh, women from Philippines, Thailand, Russia and Poland are also entering as brides. And those women are also met with skepticism. Um, especially the Russian women, I would say, are met with skepticism in, in northern part of Norway. And similar to my respondents, they're accused of pro forma marriages and they are also being labeled as male order brides and subjected to suspicion as well. So, um, how do I conceptualize? How can we conceptualize migration? And I was asked to look at it, uh, conceptualize my own findings within a lifestyle migration, labor migration, and marriage migration. And uh, I would say that labor migration was not really what I thought of, because uh, those women are entering the country as brides, or they are entering as marriage migrants. And the, there's a huge difference between being a labor, labor uh, migrant and marriage migrant. So, but even 
of the differences, I could see the downward mobility uh, among um, third world migrants. So um, I would say that uh, migration can be conceptualized with the lifestyle migration, labor migration, and marriage migration. And uh, if we think about lifestyle migration, it's about seeking a better life. Migrants moving from one place to the other, seeking something better, something that they couldn't uh, find in their home country. So the similarities, I would say, with, the, with um, Russian women and my respondents is seeking a better life. And they really want parity, gender equality in the private sphere. So that's very similar to what those women in Russia, East, West, marriage relations, and North, South, marriage relations. And they also have this, what I call, white male <laughs> syndrome, stereotyping, positive stereotyping, where the men are being um, positively stereotyped as being responsible and making better partners and fathers. And um, by choosing marriage migration, they are able to create the lifestyle desired. But this is a discussion uh, that, that uh, is, is it really the lifestyle that, that's desired? Maybe they can get something in the private sphere, but what about in greater society? And the same kind of discourses that's also in the Faroe Islands and in Russia, uh, uh, in North Norway, concerning uh, East-West um, marriage migration. Love. How do we conceptualize love? How do we conceptualize marriage? What is a good marriage? What is love? So, I ask myself this question as well. Love is perceived to be missing often in those marriages, both by the locals and the immigration authorities as well, where they are... Um, I, was averse, I was very surprised to see that in Norway, you don't need to live together in the same household if you are married. But if it's, uh, but if it's a migrant, a marriage migration, then you have to prove that you're living together for three years in order to receive a permanent residency. So it's, there are different criteria for Norwegian people and for mig migrants married with Norwegian men. So they are, they are being um, observed and, and the marriage is being stereotyped by the immigration authorities as well. And um, how can we, as researchers, conceptualize love? I would say that it's a um, matter of culture, religion, and we, I think as researchers, we shall not take our understanding of love from a Western European point of view, but try to open our horizons and think about, okay, well, how do those people from other, with other cultures, other backgrounds, conceptualize love? What does it mean for them in the sociological traditions? And what is a good marriage? What are the criteria that non-Western women are, um, are, are setting themselves concerning love and marriage? And I would say that these are questions that need to be um, questions that needs empirical research or, or interviews or, or, or doing further, further, further research on that. So I would say there are some intersec intersectional similarities and differences among my, um, between my respondents and marriages between Eastern and Western migrants. The similarities are the character as women are essentialized. The experiences of, stereotype, of stereotyping is due to the country of origin as well. The culture of what is love and marriage is being misunderstood. And they are considered again as ordered women, male order brides. And the differences, I will say, is, the po of course, the political, um, due to political issues between Russia and Norway 
international politics, I would say, complex construction of gender is between the nationality and, political inter inter and politics intersects in the con construction of otherness of Russian women, I would say, compared to my respondents. It's not about politics, but I would say it's about skin color, race, ethnicity, and also the country of origin. So, also when we think about um, lifestyle migration, it depends very much who is moving where. If it's European moving to India or Thailand or some third world countries, the stru I, will, I would say the structural boundaries would be different because they are able to take the power relations as European to those countries compared to migrants from third world countries moving to Europe, where they will experience other kind of structural boundaries, especially when moving in the country, when to have working permit and to obtain um, residence, uh, residence permit and so on. There are other kind of criteria because they are seen as poorer than Europeans. So these are the structure, structural boundaries I have found in, in, um, in the questions that you sent me. Yeah. Thank you very much. So now we are ready for the first opponent. My Camilla Monkior, please. Okay. So is it on? Yes, it is. just put it here so I don't lose it on the floor. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, thank you very much for a very fine presentation of the main findings in your thesis and for a very fine uh, answer to the theme that we asked you to reflect on. Very good. Um, I'd like to just present myself briefly. Uh, my name is Mike Camilla Munkio, and as was mentioned, I work as a research professor at a Norwegian research institute called Norse. It's a fusion, so we are quite arrogant and we call us the <laughs> Norwegian <laughs> Research Center in Norway. We're the second largest. Anyway, I do also have two part-time positions, one as a professor in rural studies at the Arctic University of Norway, and one small part-time position as a professor in innovation and regional development uh, at Western Norway. Uh, Western Norway University of Applied Sciences in Bergen. Um, and just to say a little bit about my background to you, so that you know kind of what position I, I'm talking from, I actually did a PhD quite kind of similar to your PhD 10 years ago. I studied in migration to Finnmark in northernmost Norway. And Finnmark, for those of you who know that, is actually a kind of a region that is kind of similar to f the Faroe Islands. It's, it's quite remote. Uh, it's a small population in a huge landscape. Um, and yeah, so there are different, different similarities in the landscapes and the geographical context. And I also studied in migrants' experiences of settling in the rural north and sense of place and belonging and their everyday life. So I just say that because that was one of the reasons why I was happy when I was asked to be in your assessment committee, because I kind of, I'm interested in the topic that you have written about. And to start with that, it was really a pleasure to read your thesis and I think it's empirically strong. Uh, you do sound and sensitive, and um, I had another word here, nuanced, nuanced uh, intersectional analysis of your findings. So, very good. Um, and just to the audience, um, before we start, I'd like to say to everyone that it's different ways of doing an opposition. You have some opponents who like to ask 
you know, the hardest possible questions in order to make the candidate feel that if you had done the research in my way, it would have been so mm. much better. <laughs> and then you have the other kind of opponents who kind of try to ask both critical and open questions and who would want the candidate to actually convey their message. And I'm, I try to be in the second category. I think this is your day and this is your opportunity to really defend your thesis and explain why you did what you did and how you did it. So please feel free also when asked difficult questions to just twist it a little bit and give your <laughs> message. Yeah. So, <laughs> good. Yeah, I think... You know, that's it. So, I'll, ask, I'll start by an easy question. Uh, you have a background yourself mm -hmm. as a marriage migrant here, and you talked a little bit about your motivation um, be, yeah, in the beginning of your presentation, but still, how come you chose to do not only a small study, but a whole PhD on this theme? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I moved here to the Faroe Islands for almost 20 years ago now, so it's a huge part of my life. Um, I lived in Denmark from 2009 to 15, moved back to the Faroe Islands in 15, and I could see that there was really a huge demographic changes in, in the Faroe Islands. And also the Faroe Islands position in politics, and we are a part of Denmark, and we don't have an integration politics. I was curious mm. to know what's going on here, Why, uh, how come that I can see so many people from different backgrounds moving to the Faroe Islands and an increasing number as well, but the government not doing anything about that. Mm. And um, also in schools and kindergartens where you, ha you have children with mis mixed backgrounds and I have heard so many stories about misunderstandings and cultural misunderstandings, miscommunications as well. So for me, uh, I, must say I have an, a background in international relations. So moving from international relations to gender has been a huge, huge, huge leap. So even though I was quite... Um, New, I was really new to the field. I wanted to know how are these women coping in everyday lives? And also hearing about the, as I mentioned, the stereotyping of, those, of these men and these women in everyday lives. I was like, okay, is, that, is it true? Are these women really bold women? How, where does those stereotypes come from? Because I didn't know anything about that. So for me, it was really a matter of curiosity, even, even though when I moved here, there were, there were few foreigners when I moved here, mm -hmm. but, I, and I never received, really received or heard of those discourses at that time. Mm -hmm. But when I moved here, when I moved back here in 2015, I think that it really changed with both discourses and demography. Mm. So that, and, and also there's where there was no integration policy mm. and still no integration politics. Mm. So, so that was my main reason. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's an excellent reason. I really appreciate research that really talks to urgent matters mm. in the society that we live in so that we can kind of shed light on those issues and try to find new solutions. And I, I'm, I'm sure that your thesis will contribute to the development of integration policies because it's important, we need it. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, lots of different things to, to continue on here, but I think the, uh, this stereotyping that, and these discourses, this these negative pejorative discourses about female migrants coming. I think if we start there, just if I can say one, one critique, that we said that in the thesis, I think it's a really important theme, but you kind of just describe it quite, not superficially, but at least quite shortly, kind of refer to that. Many of your participants, they have personal experiences with stereotypes, mm -hmm. and there are some details about how it happens and where it happens, but as a reader, I, I kind of wanted, I expected some thicker descriptions of, mm. of how are those, you know, how is it to mm -hmm. meet those kind of stereotypes? Who utter them? Is it in the media? Is it in social media? Is mm. it in 
you know, <laughs> social parties? Is it out on Friday evening when we drink a beer? Or, you know, how is this phenomenon taking place? Mm -hmm. and, and how is it kind of going on? And with that critique, wh what do you think about that? If you were able to step back three years, how could you have kind of gone deeper into that yeah. problem to shed more light on that as kind of a starting point for your thesis? Mm. Yeah, mm. I, I, I agree with you. And, and those discourses, I would say, it's mostly common among the locals and maybe not so much discussed in, of course, in, on Facebook you can see the negative stereotyping mm. and, and discourses, but not so much the newspaper, I think, or the news. It's not, it's not feeling, it's not something that you, you hear in, in daily lives on the news in, in the Faroe Islands. But among the locals and what how and and how and what i meant was that it it, it it's my mean it means like a joke sometimes to say it like as a joke but it's doing something to those who can hear that mm. but uh, yeah if i did it some other way maybe i, I would have asked Faroese people as well what do they mean by that mm. or i think i've been quite thorough with um with asking the woman where did they experience those mm. stereotyping? Mm. And, um, and uh, for me, the, main, the most important thing was not on the stereotyping uh, of them as women, but also uh, women and family situations and on the labor market as well. Mm. So it was not just personal stereotyping, but stereotyping all the way through. Mm. So that's why maybe I didn't really focus upon um, the personal, just personal, uh, uh, the woman's experiences of mm. the personal stereotyping of them and the husband, mm. but which I did also. Mm. But uh, it was mainly all the way through from uh, the yeah, mi it's, it's, it's a micro level, yeah. but also their relationship with the field, with mm. the labor market and mm. the family relationship, mm. which I can see even if I don't m say it, it's stereotyping, but you can read it through mm. that it is stereotyping mm. and stigma st stigmatization. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good answer. I'm going back to other questions, but just one more question about that. Yeah. In terms of theory, kind of ha ha what kind of theories do you think are useful to make sense of these kind of jokes? Mm. Ah. This is something. <laughs> yeah. You can think in your thesis, do you kind of, how do you explain that those kind of jokes are taking place? Yeah. Um, my thesis uh, um, is um, I looked at gender theory mm. and postcolonial theories mm. and the theory of practice mm. of Bourdieu. And I think that um, the uh, I would say that yes, when those jokes are going uh, are taking place, I I lack a kind of theory to conceptualize that. Mm. But what I wanted to do was was showing the woman's experiences, mm. and it was not about migration. Of course, it's marriage migration, mm. but it was the consequences of migration. How do they experience the live lives in the Faroe Islands as mm. women? Mm. So, uh, I think that by using the gender theory mm. that I did mm. shows that there is a phenomenological way of doing gender, mm. but at the same time, there are structures who mm. are constructing, constructing those gender relations. Mm. So, um, I wanted to show that, uh, as Judith Butler says, that gender has a beginning and, an, and it doesn't end like that. Mm. It's a uh, intersubjective relationship mm. and when you're moving from one place to the other mm. you will take something with you and you will c it will continue in s somewhere else mm. and as Bojo mentions, mentions as well he doesn't look at gender mm -hmm. but the, the contact of the habitus to mm -hmm. the field mm -hmm. so I think that I know that you didn't really <laughs> see how Bojo contributed to to, to, to my study, but by showing, by using his, his theory, mm -hmm. I could see the relationship of the habitus to the field. Even if he doesn't talk so much about changes, I could make my own, um, my own analysis to see how those changes take place and how 
do the, uh, how is it to be a complete stranger on the field? And that's why I decided also to combine with the phenomenology of being a stranger mm -hmm. as well, to look at the field through the stranger's eyes mm -hmm. and to experience the field through the stranger's eyes and to know what's going on, um, like bodily, um, body, um, how you do your body, exactly. um, how, yeah, yeah. How and the you phenomenology, your body, how you dress. exactly, the phenomenology yeah. of doing the body as yeah. well, which is um, um, not familiar for, for a migrant moving to a new place. Yeah. So, so this is, um, I think that that's why I chose those kind of theories. Mm -hmm. And I, didn't, I, yeah, I, I would say that maybe I should have think about um, a, a theory when thinking about the jokes and so on, but, but it was not meant yeah, in, this, in this sense. It's okay. One can't do everything at the same yeah. time. Um, yeah, I think that was a very, very good answer. And I think, could you just a little bit uh, elaborate a little bit more on how Bourdieu helped you to analyze or conceptualize your yeah. data material? Yeah. Like you talked about it now, but just a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bourdieu, the theory of practice, I use theory of practice and symbolic violences. Yeah. Uh, those two concepts to, mm -hmm. to, to analyze mm -hmm. my, my findings. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, there is, Bourdieu talks about the primary and secondary socialization, which takes place. Mm -hmm. And he also mentions that the habitus is not static. He says that the habitus, it, it, can, it can change, but it takes time because as individuals, you are socialized as a child in a, in a, in a social space uh, and then you move on and then there is a secondary socialization process. Mm. And um, he also looked at, at the field. I think for me, the most interesting thing, uh, um, a concept with Bourdieu was the contact of the habitus with the new field mm. where the uh, locals are used to the rule of the games, mm -hmm. but how do migrants internalize, have to re-internalize the rule of the games on the new field? Mm. So I think that that made a good concept, especially for the um, third part of my analysis, mm. where I look at uh, migrants, uh, how do they... Um, um, reposition themselves mm. on the field mm. and uh, what are the coping strategies as well. Mm. And also with sim in, in relations to symbolic violences, mm -hmm. how are they also contributing as migrants mm. to be marginalized on, on the labor market? Because even though if they don't like it, but they are accepting the fact that they are marginalized. Mm. And this is kind of symbolic violences mm. that they are causing to themselves as well. Mm. So I think that those are the concepts that Bourdieu really helped with. Mm. And, and, and also the structures. I think when we are talking about gender and stereotyping mm. and othering, it's very important to think about structures as well. Mm. Because I think sometimes with m lifestyle migration, um, there was something lacking there. Mm. I, I read uh, the theory. And I did understand that, okay, in, in lifestyle, lifestyle migration as well, they talk about, okay, what happened afterwards? There is a re renegotiation of identity and also how you place yourself on the, gr on the ground, on the field again. Mm. But what I like with Butcher is the structure, okay, mm. and the reconciliation of the agent and the structure. Mm. Yeah. It's a very good answer, and I think that some of what you're saying now is perhaps clearer when you speak than what we can read throughout <laughs> the thesis even. Mm -hmm. and, but that's okay. But I c think that's what you can do when you write your articles now after the, the defense. Uh, those things that you're saying now, you can make them even more clear mm -hmm. in the article. Mm -hmm. and, I, and perhaps you could even argue that using Bourdieu in this way actually helps advancing mm -hmm. Uh, theories on, on migration and for instance and perhaps you could even use Bourdieu in order to see how marriage migration and lifestyle migration are yep. actually highly interrelated yep. and then you can show how they're interrelated. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's, that's perhaps one of my main comments th is that it, it's possible for you actually since you have such a rich empirical material yeah, to concretize some of your findings and to make them even clearer in the mm -hmm. text and I'm sure that 
you can do that yep. in further articles. Um, again, lots of things to continue talking about. I think, for instance, this point about gender and equality and how, how leaving one's country of origin is, in one way, it's a statement for some of the women that I'm leaving my country of origin. It could be, as you show, it's a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons, if you're divorced, it might be because you're a damaged mm -hmm. good, as you said. Yeah. You're, not, you're no, no longer kind of, um, at least not attractive mm -hmm. on, the, on the marriage, uh, marriage market in the country of origin. And perhaps as a middle class, highly educated woman, you're also not accepting a submissive role in the marriage. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, you, by leaving, you negotiate gender and equality and the country of origin. And then you describe also how you continue to negotiate the meaning of gender and equality mm -hmm. in the Faroe Islands, so in the new context of residence. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that, on, on how, you, how you see that those negotiations of gender and, e and equality are going on in your material? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, through the interviews I asked the women exactly um, why. Mm. Why did they choose marriage migration and mm -hmm. why did they find Faroe Islands or Europe attractive to them? Mm -hmm. what, what were the causes for that? And one of the main reasons was um, they don't find men in the home country as attractive. Mm -hmm. And then I asked them, okay, um, how, uh, how is your life now? How, mm -hmm. how, how is the uh, situation for you now in, mm -hmm. in, 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 a new, in a relationship mm -hmm. or new relationship? Mm -hmm. So um, they talked about what I call the imaginary Europe mm. and the imaginary, what I say, the white male syndrome, mm. seeing everything better here. Mm. And at the same time, seeing that when I ask them what are the criteria of a good marriage, it's about, for us, maybe not acceptable, but for them, having a man as a leader, mm. but at the same time, wanting equality in the Mm. in the marriage. Mm. But I, I couldn't really, um, as, as I mentioned, the complexities. Mm. How, do you, how, how do you define that? You know, mm. How do you define gender equality in, 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 a, in a relationship? Mm. And, and the negotiation goes on all the time mm. because they, the, the women expect things from the husband mm. and the husbands expect things from the, the, the women as well. Mm. And through these four couple interviews I have made, mm. Some of the women wanted a modern or mm. not a traditional man. Mm. And then the man wanted someone who reminded him more as his mother, mm. uh, women from the 50s. So how do I, yeah, exactly. how, how does it fit, you know? Mm. Mm. And it's, 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 it's difficult to mm. say um, how does those things fit together. Mm. And as you mentioned, if I did a thick description maybe or, or, or have some observation, I would see, okay, I would observe other things. Mm. But they mentioned that those negotiations goes on every day mm. and that it's something that you have, because it's, they are culturally different. Mm. So yeah, expectation from the woman can mm. be different and expectation from the man can be different. Mm. And through those four couple interviews, I think I have seen a huge dynamics among those four couples, mm. depending upon if they are religious and yeah. uh, where they are from, from mm. the Faroe Islands. Mm. And even though two of them were from, from uh, villages, mm. they were completely different interviews because uh, one, of, one of the couple, they were really, they have been living abroad and came back to the Faroe Islands and uh, they see their lives as more cosp cosmopolitan mm. and, and, and um, combining different um, mm. uh, way of living. Mm. And the other couple from, from the same village was completely different because they were both Christians and mm. they met on a Christian homepage. So mm. their lifestyle is about the man having his place and the woman having their place. Mm. So uh, I would say that there are complexities and different dynamics as well mm. uh, uh, upon how they are negotiating gender um, or, or how they are doing their couples. It's, it's, it's 
very different from each other. Mm. Mm. Another theme uh, that uh, we find very interesting in your thesis and it, that you described well in your presentation is the othering of migrants and, and migrants, highly educated migrants, as an untapped resource in the local labour market. And um, in the thesis you show that, um, that how this happens in, in, in several ways, such as not getting your diploma or education from the co country of origin accepted and mm -hmm. not having good structures for going through those mm -hmm. diplomas and accepting them. You also show that there are high requirements when it comes to language knowledge that mm -hmm. you should you know, you should be able to speak and understand perhaps both yeah. Faroese and, and Danish, Danish languages. And at the same time, you show that language classes are not necessarily available. Mm. Uh, so different dynamics going on at the same time, but leading to highly educated and not so highly educated women feeling like not recognized, mm. feeling declassed, feeling ignored perhaps even. And, and excluded. So, so these processes have really important um, consequences on an individual level, but also on a societal level. Something's uh, new, like um, the society that actually need mm -hmm. these women and this competence is actually not making use of competence which is there mm -hmm. and which the society need. And, and my argument would be that like in any society, you know, what, what, what kind of society can permit itself not to use resources available uh, because when we actually need those resources in order to develop, etc. So, so can you comment a bit on that? I, in my opinion, that's kind of one of the strongest points in your thesis mm -hmm. that you show these dynamics and the consequences on both an individual and a societal level yep. and that kind of indirectly you argue very strongly that something has to be done. But yep. Yep. what do you think? I think that um, as migration is quite new mm. and we don't have an integration policy yet, but mm. we are preparing mm. for one, we have a huge opportunity to do something different from other European countries mm. because the type of migration we have in the Faroe Islands are very different from other European countries. Mm. It's not refugees coming here, it's married people moving here and those people want to contribute to society i think that we have a huge opportunity by to use those people on the labor market of course there is also unemployment among academics in the faroe islands i'm not saying we shall find acad academic jobs to everyone here it's not that but being marginalized and being put in a position where your only your only um potential is seen to be on an un unqualified job mm. is quite disturbing, I mm. think. Mm. And as I mentioned as well, being subordinated mm. in, this, in this position creates what I think is the new poor of society, a gendered new poor in society. And we talked about empowerment of women, but what about empowerment of migrant women living here? Mm. I mean, it, it's not enough that they are just married to a man, but what about the individual level as well as for them as women? Mm. So I will say that we need laws when we are thinking about overtaking um, migration uh, policy. Mm. I think we have to think about empowerment of migrant mm. women mm. here mm. because they are really not in an empowering position at the moment. Mm. So. That will be my main thing mm. if I go into politics sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that this is something very, very important, I think, to, yeah. to, to empower migrant women. Just mm. as we talk about mm. Faroese women, mm. we have to talk about migrant women on the same level. Mm. And if we go just a bit outside of the thesis then and imagine your, you, you as a politician in the future, kind of what would be a concrete solution that you see? Yeah, I think it's um, m mostly... Uh, the labor market mm -hmm. has to be open. Yeah, and how? Uh, by accepting that Danish and Faroese are not the only languages that need to be used in, mm -hmm. in the la on the labor market. Mm -hmm. And by tapping on those people's um, um, uh, capital and seeing potential in them. Mm -hmm. And, and as I think that we are very much in the Faroe Islands um, 
focus on Denmark and mm. not on the outside world. Mm. So, so being open, mm. labor market being more open and flexible. Mm. Of course, as I mentioned, it w we cannot employ everybody, mm. but in tourism, I would say, mm. perfect place. Mm. And, and also uh, marketing, perfect place as well, because many of my respondents are within tourism mm. or marketing. Mm. And I can see that they could totally be use their capital on, mm. on those, on those mm. fields. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. But I agree with you. And, and we have the same challenges in Norway as well. And then one solution also would be to use the workplace as an arena for language mm. learning so that you don't need to speak the language yeah. before yeah. you start, but that you use the opportunity while you work to also learn the language. And then there are different ways of, of paying that salary. Yeah. It could be better to get perhaps some some welfare and some sa ordinary mm -hmm. salary while you train yeah. and learn the language while working. But also, as you say, that open up the idea of what is the proper language on this workplace. Yeah. And for instance, the tourism industry, I think it's an excellent example. Yeah. Um, different themes that I wanted to, to um, shed light on. Um, I have a difficult question. <laughs> How, how would you explain the structural and cultural barriers producing migrants of less, as of less value than the majority population? What, yeah, do you, is it clear? How would you explain the structural and cultural barriers mm -hmm. producing migrants mm -hmm. as of less value mm -hmm. than the majority population? Yeah, I think it's historical. Yeah. Um, it's, um, the, this othering is doesn't happen just it doesn't come just like that. Mm. It's something constructed over time. Mm. And also the media and mm. newspapers and so on, constructing mm. those images of the others. And it didn't start there. It mm. started for a long time ago. It mm. has a historical mm. background, mm. different historical background with different continents, mm. I would say. Mm. Because if you look at the intersections level that I had made, mm. I mean, Thai women are yeah. stereotyped in other ways, exactly. and African women are stereotyped in other ways. Mm. So all of this, it's, it's, histor it's historical background and colonial times as well, which produces those stereotyping and othering, mm. and which continues, I think, in, 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 uh, yeah, in new times, I mean, in, in our contemporary world as well. Mm. So those barriers, I would say, stay alive through the media mm. nowadays mm. and uh, also by our own uh, understanding of the world as well. Mm. How do we understand the world and, and by making othering cultures as well, um, glorifying our own culture where we come from and mm. looking down upon other cultures as well. Mm. As I mentioned, marriage and love and how do we how do we characterize that? You know, that's different from a Western perspective and through um, mm. another third mm. world perspective. How <laughs> to say third world perspective? Yeah. So it's it's culture, it's the religion, it's history. Mm. So yeah, I think it's. Do you think also that it, it's a, it's a reaction like to defend? I, I want to defend myself because now cultural change is going on so fast and so rapidly that I kind of try to hold mm. on to wh what it was like like 10 years yeah, ago yeah. or before because it's safer yeah to kind uh, of to try to yeah i mean i i yeah. still i still uh, i mentioned that the farewell is still a homogeneous society yeah, with, with 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 culture and language mm. and i think maybe it's something with that as well protecting yourselves from the other um culture or your language changing as well. Mm. But I would say if the Faroe Islands want to keep the culture, cultural perspective have a meaning for the, for also for the language, then something needs to be done mm. on the integration level, mm. learning migrants the language exactly. so that the language could be, mm. is, is imp I mean, a language is quite important for, for Faroese people. So I mm. think that it's a defense mechanism, yes, mm. yeah. but Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and as we talked about earlier, that language learning may actually take place on the labor market or yeah. in the workplace, but of course, not just by putting migrants there, but by doing yeah. the language education yeah. on, th on the work, on yeah. the spot. Yeah, and some of the working places are doing that in the yeah. Faroe Islands. Yeah. So, and it it's works very well. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Russian migrants. How, how is it when it comes to time? 
Do we have like 15 minutes left? 10 minutes, okay. So I have to choose what questions <laughs> to go into. Um, but I think I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Russian migrants. Um, you mentioned them yourself. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, Tatiana Vara, she did a mm -hmm. PhD on Russian migrants in, in Finnmark a couple of years ago. And uh, she found that me female Russian migrants who had settled with a Norwegian man who could be actually characterized as marriage migrants, mm -hmm. they chose themselves to identify as students or yeah. as, uh, or as uh, labor, labor migrants, specialists, because they were medical doctors as well, right? So they had the opportunity to try to, to choose another identity because of stereotypes, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, um, addressing those marriage migrants. Mm -hmm. So if you came for another reasons, like if you came to study or to work, that was kind of a of higher va value mm. into brackets than coming for love. Mm. Because if you came for love, as mm. you said, your motive would be questioned. Is it real love mm -hmm. or is it just performa? And um, it was very, it, I think when I read your thesis, I, I kind of had those other studies in mind and I, I thought that it's so similar processes going on, so similar stigmatizing processes taking place in different local communities. And, and just to give another example then from Northern Norway, what we saw is that the women, they said that after I came here, I've started to dress differently. Mm. Uh, I no longer wear skirts, I don't put on red lipstick, I do my hair differently. And so we call the, the article dressing down to fit in. I don't know if you took yeah, a look yeah, at it, but yeah. what, what, do you have any comments to that, to those similarities mm. really happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, some of my respondents talked about that as well, and mm. I didn't analyze that in uh -huh. my in my in my thesis, but they talked about um, the lifestyles mm. completely changed mm. when they moved to mm. the Faroe Islands mm. because they are used to warm weather and mm -hmm. dressing up mm -hmm. and going out and mm. partying in other ways and then moving here. They mm. didn't really know what they were moving, mm. what the Faroe Faroe Islands was about, mm -hmm. and. And moving here, they, it was a huge cultural shock for mm -hmm. them. The weather and the people, <laughs> the, the people are different from mm -hmm. what they are used to. Mm -hmm. Both um, how they express themselves and how they are dressed. Mm -hmm. And are women allowed to wear makeup every day and hairstyle mm -hmm. and doing manicure and pedicure and, and so on. They, mm -hmm. they talked about that. Mm -hmm. And some of them, just as the Russian women, decided to just dress down mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And some of them, they, th they thought that, okay, I'm, I'm not thriving into this, into this uh, new position of not being the woman that I want to be. Exactly. So, so they just, um, be, uh, just be themselves. And, and some of them say that it's too expensive in mm -hmm. the Faroe Islands to, to manicure and pedicure <laughs> and what, is what they are used to. Mm. So yes, there are similarities. Mm -hmm. And one mentioned, mm -hmm. She was from, she's from Thailand, mm. that some people refer to her as a cheap woman because she liked to dress up mm. and like to go to town and so mm. on. And if she's in town like two weeks, uh, two weekends in a row, then people are questioning her motives as a migrant. You do have a husband, why are you in town? Why are you dressed like that? Mm. And some of mm. them told her that she was cheap. Mm. So yes, there mm. are those mm. boundaries as well, those kind of mm. stereotyping as well, mm. definitely. Mm. And in your thesis, perhaps the post-colonial theory is the, yeah. the best, or best, but it's a useful theory yeah. to make sense of this. Yeah. So yeah. how would you, because even though if you don't e analyze exactly the, the empirical data that you present now, you, yeah. you analyze different yeah. processes. Yeah. Yeah. How do you use the post-colonial theory to make sense of that? Um, in your it's thesis? again the, o the othering. The othering yeah. and uh, and creating um, conceptualizing those women as one group mm. without seeing that there are different groups and different categories mm. of women and uh, postcolonial theory it's about the historical perspective again mm. and how is the migrant woman being perceived in a Western view mm. and also within feminism because Postcolonial feminism talks about Western feminism as well, mm. where Western f some Western feminism theory has also um, um, marginalized um, or talked about 
uh, what is right, how is, it, uh, how, how is it to be a woman and what mm. is right or wrong without taking mm. culture and historical perspective into considerations. So I would say that the othering part mm. and historical perspective mm. is, is very important. I, I don't discuss history, but I know it's, it's there yeah. uh, within the uh, post-colonial theoretical mm. perspective. Mm. I know that time is starting to run out, but I have at least a couple of questions. Like one question is that you have a very, you have an empirical intake kind of in your thesis, right? Mm -hmm. You you observed, you observe differences in the de demographic development. You observe discourses going on in the society, and you felt that we have to do something. I have to study this phenomenon and find out what is going on, and based on that, perhaps mm -hmm. contribute to develop policies. A more traditional way of kind of making the research storyline is that kind of you, re you define the research field and then you say that research shows this and this and that, but there is a gap, we don't know this, and in this gap you create a room for yourself mm -hmm. and for your study and, and that your thesis is kind of a contribution to fill that gap. If you use that second storyline, what, what is the research field that you address and that you contribute to as you see it? Uh, I didn't really understand. How you didn't? No. <laughs> okay. No, but then I can. If if it was my, in my view, it is yeah. actually, it is migration research in rural areas. Yeah. Actually, yeah. that I read kind of when I read it, it wasn't really so present. Mm -hmm. But when I read it, I thought that a storyline could be like, um, um, female migration is an increasing phenomenon in many parts mm. of the world. Research shows that we have different types of migration. Mm. It's marriage migration, labor migration, um, and family re reunification, and, and female lifestyle migration, different types. And studies in, in the Nordic context shows this and that, and in particular in rural areas we see this and that. But we don't know very much about the experiences of highly educated married mm. women, uh, married migrants settling in a rural context, and this is my contribution. You know mm. that kind of story. Yeah, so, yeah. So, and, and you have kind of answered it, and you know that it's our critique, but just to end with that, how come, how come you, you didn't perceive that literature as your literature yeah, to I discuss? Yeah, I know, I know, I know, and um, <laughs> I have to apologize for no. that, <laughs> because uh, I, uh, when I uh, look at your critics afterwards, and I was, I was surprised, Sal, that I didn't really conceptualize my work with rural communities in, 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 in the north. Mm -hmm. uh, I conceptualized my work mainly with our American and Asian mm -hmm. as well. Many yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's a critique that I need to take mm. on me. Yeah, mm. yeah. But then I could say, because then I think, yeah, then I think time is going on, but then I think that what you could do is that you have a very rich empirical material, mm -hmm. and then for the articles, it's not too late to do yeah. that contextualization. Absolutely. And I think that, for instance, it's a, call, it's a journal called yeah. Socio Sociologia, uh, Sociologia, Socio what is it? I, I'm not able to say the word. So, no, Socio Rurales, Sociologia Rurales. That's okay. a journal yeah. in rural sociology. Mm -hmm. Sorry for not being able to pronounce it. And I think though they would be really yeah. interested yeah. in a study on female marriage migrants Absolutely. to this kind of context. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's about, because I think it's a contribution to what happens in, in rural areas. Yeah. Yeah. And rural, it's not only about farming and yeah. farmland, yeah. but it's about Small smaller yeah. remoteness, island and compactness. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the fact that we are talking about compact rural communities along the coast, mm -hmm. that kind of allows for a certain social and cultural, certain cultural and, 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 cultural and social processes going on, and yeah. it's something particular to that. Mm -hmm. And then you could add something to that. Yeah, so absolutely. Sociologia Ruralis, that was the word. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really a journal yeah. that you could yeah. consider. And of course, like International Women's Forum and yeah. Journal of Gender Studies and those kind yeah. of journals. Yeah. yeah. So I'm looking forward to your next contributions. And so far, thank you very much for, thank your you very much. for our discussion. It was yeah. very interesting. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I give the word to you. I give the word to Firuz before we take a break. So it's not on, is it? Give this then. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, very good uh, time discipline. <laughs> so now we have uh, 20 minutes break before we start again. Uh, 
And uh, if anyone has uh, questions, ex auditoria, you should contact me during the break. So we'll meet again in 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. And coffee outside again? And there is coffee outside, yeah.
Oh, yeah, here. So uh, I think that it's time to start again with the second part of this uh, PhD defense. And we have received uh, one question ex auditorio by uh, Birgit Remmel. So I'm going to give her the microphone. Thank you so much, Juna. It was super interesting, and I think it's very necessary research. And uh, I, I would have loved if there were more politicians present, actually, to listen to your presentation. Maybe it should be a lot of more information out to, to uh, have people listen to this kind of research, which is so important. Um, I myself have a foreign a background. I moved here in my mid-twenties uh, from Denmark, and I'm originally from Germany. Um, and I'm now so integrated, so I actually teach fairies at the local high school. <laughs> so I'm like hyper-integrated. Um, but still, I recognize so many things you spoke about in your thesis about um, the stereotype typing and the otherness and stuff. And um, actually, I was met with a lot of stereotypes towards Germans, both positive and negative. And also, when I spoke Danish in the beginning, as a Dane, so this, despite having the same skin color. Um, and I would ask you, you, you uh, have uh, talked to four husbands in your research. And I find that very interesting because it's uh, like in the marriage, there are two parts. So the husband's stereotypes towards the woman also play a very important part uh, in what you call the ongoing negotiation in the marriage. Um, everybody started to laugh when you mentioned somebody said, oh, why aren't you more like mom? I've actually heard that one. <laughs> and. Uh, I would like you just to elaborate a little bit more about that, the, the men's uh, stereotypes towards their partners, and also maybe take into consideration that the woman's house is actually full of third world women when the, the negotiations fail and the mar marriage ends in divorce, which is super difficult. So could you please do that? Thank you. Yeah, um, as I mentioned uh, also in the second chapter of my analysis that marriage uh, is a transaction and an on ongoing um, negotiations among intercultural couples. And um, I would say that the expectations may be different from uh, the man and the woman. And when I asked one of my respondent, a male respondent, why he was, uh, why did he actively choose a wife from the Philippines? His answer was um, that he wanted a more traditional wife and he wanted a life that he could recognize, um, he can recognize during his childhood. And I would say that those men are also stereotyping those women as being traditional. So the ongoing um, stereotyping can also take place in the, in the marriage. And maybe the expectation of the man and the woman are, can be totally different. And the women I've spoken to, they wanted a more modern life and at the same time what how i conceptualize it they are in the middle of two gender systems trying to uh, navigate through their own gender systems which they are familiar to and trying to negotiate the new gender system which on the new field and finding themselves somewhere in between there so the expectations are huge 
I mean, from the male side and the, and the women's side, and some of them are on the same level, where they are, yeah, uh, doing families or doing gender on the same level, and some of them, it's like hierarchy in, in, in the marriage as well, which is accepted as well in the couple, and some of them did have different expectations. All right, thank you. So now it's time for the second opponent, Stephen Arnfjord. Got a little sudden tint, hello. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Still on? Oh, it is on. Right. Questions for Runa? <coughs> well, first of all, thank you very much for this contribution. Um, it was, it was super exciting to read about your endeavors into, into marriage migration, um, um, especially because uh, we, we are shown a part of society and we are, we are, we are hearing a, a voice or voices of, of women that, that, that are usually silent um, because we neglect to listen or we haven't set up a system for, for, for us to listen to them. So, so, so thank you for that. Um, I can sort of relate to, to some of the issues going on in the Faroe Islands. I, I come from, well, I come from Greenland. Well, <laughs> 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 well, I live in Greenland. I've lived in Greenland all my life. So, but, and, and, and back home, we are seeing a, um, a, a growing community of, of, uh, of, of Thai and, 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 and Filipino people, uh, um, uh, but unfortunately not the African uh, uh, communities. But uh, let's see what happens in, in the future, though. Um, I enjoyed reading it. Um, I did. Uh, I was giving loads of insights. Um, so, when you hand a piece of work uh, or piece of yourself over to the academic community, uh, you're bound to get some responses. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's sort of our nature to ask questions. Uh, it would almost be rude of an academic community not to ask questions. It's basically like, like going to a psychiatrist. You're bound to get away with, with a diagnosis of some, some kind uh, when we do this. Um, so I grew up in a small country. I'm part of a settler community. I'm sort of the, the, face, the face of colonialism, if, if, you, if you might say. Um, and 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 I so, so of course I have I have um, I have a, a sense of this from a very very different uh, very different perspective, uh, very prosperous perspective, some might say. Uh, but but it does take time to get integrated in 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 a, in a small community or or just a just a some might say coastal country, right? Or, uh, in Greenland, we don't like the word rural. It doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, to use it, I can see how it's suppliable in in the Faroe Islands, obviously, uh, but but please don't call us small uh, back home anyway. Um, it's just a community, it's just a society. It just happens not to be a lot of people living there uh, compared to Germany or whatever, wherever you're from, basically. So um, I know that when I'm asking the following questions, I might run <coughs> the risk of not getting invited to the party tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I'll take that as sort of part of my job to, to ask questions, right? Um, and I think maybe, well, you get used to that. You're all probably already used to that, that, that uh, questions is, is sort of a... We, we sort of congratulate your work when, when, when we take an interest in it. We ask questions and we want to hear about you, hear about your reflections. Uh, we, we, we did that already uh, through, through my, my uh, uh, questions and through X Auditorium. So let's start off a little bit about, about you, actually. Could you, not you, you <laughs> but you as a researcher, um, could you elaborate a little bit about the different roles you took during your process yeah. as a researcher? Mm. Maybe as a woman, if you identify as a mm. woman. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Judy Butler. Uh, <laughs> but just a little bit about that. Yeah, um, yeah that was an interesting process, actually. Um, getting in contact with the field. Because uh, as I mentioned uh, in my um, presentation, also in my PhD, that I had to take in into consideration that I am a woman, brown-skinned, and also in a cross-border marriage. And some people may think that it would be 
easier for me to get in contact with the field. But actually, it was the opposite for me. Because um, most of them couldn't identify with who I was. Um, in the sense that I speak Faroese, I speak Danish, I'm a researcher, and my social groups are mostly Faroese people. So my motives for talking about or, or wanting to interview them was questioned. And there were rumors, actually, about what I wanted to do. It was about that I was working for the government to, to expel them from the countries. And um, there were lots of rumors that I had to work through. Actually, it took me six months before I could get the first interview. So I had to get through some of the gatekeepers as well, both on the Philippines community and the Thai community, not uh, um, between the African community. And, um, and yes, I had to create this um, sense of we belong in the same group, at the same time thinking, reflecting upon my position as a researcher, that I shall not go native. But I was forced, in a way, to open up about my own experiences in the start. So, um, I contacted those women uh, through Facebook, and I asked also other people, uh, um, other, other immigrants, if they knew or if they were interested to, to talk to me. And I wrote a letter and explained them about my PhD and so on. But I found out that it was not a good, um, <laughs> a good way of doing it, because it was maybe too academics in a way. So I had to, to talk to them eye, eye to eye and, and building trust and showing them that I'm also on the same page in a way and I just want to know how you're experiencing the Faroe Islands and being a marriage migrant just as I am also a marriage migrant but I want to know more about that because there are so many people moving here. So I had to build trust and it took me a long time to build trust. And I would say that uh, coming through or going through a gatekeeper is the main important thing. So uh, being able to build a trust with the gatekeepers was the main important thing for me. So um, the first meeting was not actually the interview itself. I had 21, 21 interviews and um, some of these women, I, was, I went to a coffee shop with them just to talk and just to explain them what it's about and just to know about their relations with the Faroe Islands, with the public and so on, just to build trust with them. And then afterwards we, um, we, we went on with the interview maybe one or two weeks later. So it was about building trust and also how I positioned myself on, on the field was quite important because as I mentioned, I'm a woman and I identified as a woman <laughs> and, and a researcher as well. So, so how, how do I, as a woman and a researcher, keep also the distance, but at the same time, they have to feel safe with me. So, so those were the things that I reflected upon in, in my methodology as well. So, yeah. Good, good, thank you. The reason why I'm asking crazy questions if Runa identifies as a woman <laughs> uh, is because that we are working within a field of social constructionism uh, about performativity. Uh, you perform your gender in, in such a way. So this is a little bit about what I mm. want to challenge you a little bit about mm. uh, later on though. But, um, but, but could we, if we could stay just on a methodology just a little bit. Um, so. 21 interviews, four couple interviews, um, and qualitative. Um, so when we get qualitative interviews, we sort of get a one-sided mm. narrative of what is going on. Uh, was that a conscious choice of yours, or would you have liked to move on to, to field work? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I talked to that with my supervisor, 
and uh, I was supposed to follow them to uh, gatherings, uh, seeing, looking at the connection between the husband and the wives in those gatherings. And uh, as I mentioned, due to how the field, how it was difficult for me to get into the field, I had to to just focus on interviews and doing qualitative um, method by using interviews. So yes, I think that if I have to um, uh, more ethnographic work or thick descript description work, maybe I would have seen some, I, I believe I would have seen some other kinds of, of dynamics in, in, in those couples to what they are saying and, and also how I would have interpreted those, those, um, those uh, observations, maybe it would have been different kind of, of uh, analysis uh, if it was a combination of observation and, um, and interviews. So yes, and it was also a question of, um, of time. I had three years and I used almost five to six months to get through my respondents. So it was also a question of, of time. At that time, I decided to, okay, I'm just sticking to, to interviews. Yeah. Okay. So, so how is the, the current relationship with, uh, with these women uh, going on? Did you, did, you, did you break off the contact? Or, or do you have some, some, some things put in place where you report back to? if we can call it a community, uh, basically, or, or, or co communicate your findings back to the women? Not yet, okay. no. Um, I think that it's quite sad that none of them <laughs> are, none of the migrant community uh, is here today, because um, it, it's also, it's about them. It's about showing the, uh, uh, the differences among women without using uh, stereotyping. So. Yeah, um, no, I don't have any relationship or, or of course, I, I, if I meet them on the, uh, on the street or on the shops, we say hi and hello, it's a, such a small community. But none of them have asked me about um, my findings or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. W what was a common thing that the gatekeepers uh, told you or said to you? Uh, how did they allow your access to the, to the field? It was first of all... Is it through an uncle system or auntie what? system? There's an uncle and auntie system sometimes. Uh, it's a woman. Right. Um, yeah. And, um, and someone that I know, <laughs> I, can, I can't no, say. No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, some Faroese people who knew who the gatekeepers were actually, who put me in contact, set me in contact with, with the gatekeepers. And I contacted the gatekeeper and then they wanted to meet me and just to know, you know, like an interview if, um, if I am to be trusted or not. And then it's the gatekeepers who, contact, who contacted my respondents actually. Um, and then the respondents say yes to, to participate in, in, in my research. So it's very interesting <laughs> how this goes on, you know. So, um, and also in, in relations to um, uh, the criticism I've got um, that I didn't mention where they were from um, in my thesis. I mentioned Africa, um, Thailand, and, Thailand Philippines. and Philippines. It was because um, it's due to, to keep their anonymity. I, I can't say from which part of Africa they were from, because some of them, it was only one or two person from those countries, and it's so easy to identify. So I had to keep their, yeah, anonymity by, by, by just presenting Africa as, as a whole. And I'm very much aware that Africa is huge and different, and yeah, so, yeah. Yes, because in, in the beginning of your thesis, you write that there's a causality between low-level consideration for the women's agency yeah. uh, and the economic state of their home country. And, and that got me thinking, that was uh, quite funny, that the average ferry citizen would in initially just know the BNP of any country that these women are from and compare it to the ferries uh, BNP mm. per capita. I mean, 
are they right to conclude this? No, just as I mentioned with Maya Camilla, it's, it's something with colonialism and the historical, with the construction of where these women are. And of course, it's, um, it, I mean, it's also um, um, how these countries are portrayed both in the media and what we think about those countries. We do have our biased constructions of each part of the world. So I would say that it's mostly there, not about the BTU or not. It's, 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 I don't think it's, it's, it's not there, but it's the construction of the historical and cultural perspective. Right, right. Okay, I follow that. Thank you for that answer. Um, so, moving on to a little bit about, about uh, your, your theoretical aspects in your work. Um, so, in the beginning of your theoretical uh, chapter, you talk a lot about structure. Yeah. Um, I would even say that uh, maybe structure has been one of your main occupations during the thesis or surroundings around structure. Um, you write, uh, that's on page 58, uh, gender construction and norms are constituted through specific structures and norms. Okay, so, would you elaborate on how you see gender? Uh, or you see a gender performing agent in relations to society as a structure? Yeah, um, Judith Butler, she's good <laughs> in, <laughs> in explaining that. Um, as she says, or, and as I also report in my thesis, is gender construction is space and society and politics and religion as well. I mean, we can't understand gender relations without looking at those intersectionalities as well. There is a construction and understanding of who we are as male or female through religion, politics and, and history as well. So, um, as I mentioned, those, these women, they, they, they are longing for escaping some kind of gender structures which they don't find attractive in their home countries. And those gender constructions or those gender hierarchies are kept alive because it is acceptable there to have a hegemonic masculinity society where men are put higher up and are allowed to, do s are allowed, allowed to, to be men and women shall stay down there. And as they mentioned, men are allowed to have many partners, several partners, and those women, they don't find that as attractive. And most of them are educated women as well. And being educated and wanting something else, this shows as well, at, this specifies that gender is different from place and society. And moving to another place, of course, they are able to construct their own gender system, but there are also structures here, what is acceptable as a woman and what is not acceptable as a woman. So even though they are, they find themselves being more liberated here, but I would say that there are structures as well here that they need to be respected. Okay. Okay, Let, let's get back to the, the, the feeling of, of being liberated just, just in, in, in a short while because um, I want to stick on a little bit to the, to the, to the structure idea um, in, in your thesis. Um, you mentioned that, that, that the micros, they sort of accept uh, the structure that limits them, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so far so good. Now, if we use a word like acceptance, that's a, that's a power terminology. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Um, so these women, they, they possess power. Yeah. They, they have some sort of control over their life. They have a power to interact, a power to speak up. Um, and they have a power to challenge what you call traditionalism. Mm -hmm. uh, we might even call it a, a traditionalist, traditionalistic tru structure of, of, of race and gender. Um, so they have power? These women? Of course. I mean, uh, that's the main point with this thesis, to show that these women have position, positioned themselves as agent who have power. But how can we define power? And who has the power in the relationship? Because power is very much 
defined within migration with the third world and the first world, economic power and political power, but what about power into the private sphere as well? So by combining and by choosing what they say, they say what they told me, I would qualify this as power, taking power over their own agency. But of course they are also restricted, as I mentioned, on the societal level with downward mobility as well. So I think power doesn't mean um, just one thing. We have to conceptualize power into different uh, spheres as well. So yes, I would say that there are, of course there are power relations, different power relations that is going on through the private sphere and then the societal sphere as well. So, yes. Okay. So, so the power relation is, is some sort of uh, your idea or conceptualization of what structure is. Mm. Did they relate to you how they were able to break with structure? No, because at the moment, as I as I mentioned, the power relation in the private sphere and society are two different things. Right. And in the private sphere, they are able to negotiate what they want, how they want to be, and what they want to be, if, the, if both of them agree on that. There is a negotiation going on, but on the societal level, how, how, like as I mentioned in the third chapter of my analysis, they are being subordinated and marginalized, and they are accepting it, actually. Accepting yeah. or finding coping strategies, uh, because what else to do? They are s marginalized on the labor market as women. And I would say these are the structures that are marginalizing them. Okay, okay. I'm sorry to teach you a bit <laughs> about this. Yeah. So <laughs> If we're just clinging on a little bit to this idea of social constructionism and and um, subscribing to the ideas of Judith Butter, which I fully support that you do, I'm not a social constructionist myself, uh, but anyway, if it's a social constructed thing, mm -hmm. then it can be socially deconstructed as well. I mean, can th can they take? How can they take part in in a deconstruction of what structures them? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is something out of my, <laughs> my, I don't know, I mean, um, structure and individuals work together. I mean, structures is not something that comes from heaven. I mean, it's, it's boundaries, it's agency constructing structures, and the structures are also constructing the agency. So I would say it's a power relation uh, with both structures and agent at the same time. That is, can disempower the structure or empower the structure. Right, right, right. Super. Um, yeah. Um, so. I'm, I'm not letting you go right now. <laughs> I'm just, it's just one, one, final, one, one final thing around this. Um, so. That I and that's the thing about Bourdieu, actually, and, and some of the issues with him and, and, and his, and his, and his uh, way of, of working around this. Uh, letting the agent go at some point mm. and, and discussing, the, discussing free will and free movement. They moved already. Mm -hmm. I mean, none of these women are forced into marriages. No. I mean, this, it was an active choice. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, the whole UN thing is spilled around. I mean, every declaration has a, has a point of, of, of what free will is and, and, the, and the, the free movement of, of people, women, indigenous uh, uh, people, uh, uh, communities as well. So, how did these women talk about their free will, their active choices, when, when they talked about their everyday lives with you? With um, gender or with...? I mean, basically around everything, if we put the gender thing a little bit on the side, mm -hmm. and, uh, because uh, some of, there's, a, there's some um, aura of victimization here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned that a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Uh, so there's, a, there's both a very physical structure in society and then there's a mental image of, mm. of wanting to break out of that. Mm -hmm. 
how did they relate anyth anything about that to you? About breaking out of the... Yeah. Uh, breaking out of society's bounds over them or, or just acting the way they wanted to act. Yeah, um, it, this is not something that we talked about actually, but this is something that I could read between the lines and, and analyze because I talked about identity construction. Um, how they are uh, uh, able to um, combine their identities translocationally by combining, um, uh, by having the identity from the home country and taking on a new identity here as well. So, um, um, yes, of course, I mean, um, when I asked them about their relationships with uh, with Faroese people and, and how is it to be social here, they told me that uh, it's a different kind of way of being social with, Fer with, the, with Faroese, with, with local people here, where they have to take on a mask and try to not be themselves and take another identity to fix in, to, to, to be able to fit in uh, with with, with the Faroese way of being. And then when they are with their own ethnic group, because there are lots of meetings with the ethnic groups, with birthday parties and so on, um, then they are able to be themselves and, and, and be the person who they are. So I would say that there is um, uh, multiple identities going on when, when migration occurs. And uh, I really like the text I received from you, translocational positionality, which is really exciting, actually. <laughs> and uh, because I, I identify, or I um, analyzed uh, through an intersectional perspective, which is categories and ethnicity and so on, and could be quite closed sometimes and not looking at other kind of categories when intersectionality is involved. And with translocational positionality, I think it's, it was really interesting to look at the construction of, of identity through a social space. So, so I agree this is lacking in there, but at the same time I would say that with intersectionality, the way that I did it, with the combination with reflexivity as well and other forms of not falling into the analysis trap, I was able to show a dynamic between, among the, the respondents. Okay, yeah, 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 I sort of follow that, yeah. Okay, I have two more. <laughs> firing away like a firing squad. Okay, um, I can't help but ask a little bit about these Nordic men. <laughs> um, and, and how they are. They're very interesting to me, these, uh, this idea of the Nordic man being a good guy. Um, <laughs> because you state that, or you state that they state that, or, say that, or relate that in, in, in your interviews. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's sort of like a, it's a generalization. Mm -hmm. They feel generalized, mm -hmm. they generalize. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think perhaps that, that could be, that, that could be an, an in for you, a theoretical in, to, to, to go back to one of the very old guys within sociology or uh, social psychology, George Herbert Mead, that basically said that, well, society is the generalized other, mm. the, the, the broad mm. idea of, of what this is. But um, it's, it's still also a, an issue of, of when doing qualitative stuff, you, you also did ethno ethnographic stuff in some ways because you gained access and, and you, you, you talked to gatekeepers and stuff, um, and, and you run the risk of being too loyal to your field. Mm. Everyone does. Mm -hmm. I, I, everyone does. Um, so, if they generalize around the idea of the, of <laughs> the idea of the Nordic man being a good father uh, or, or the, the idea of the, uh, don't they also generalize around the idea of them feeling victimized and now here comes the very evil thing mm. if mm. they generalize around all of that stuff mm -hmm. what is real in mm -hmm. the interviews mm. yeah I thought about that as well because I think that I talked a lot about stereotyping and um, how they feel, but 
Is it just a perception? Is it real sometimes? I mean, are they, how are they um, constructing their reality as well? And how, uh, I mean, if someone is, 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 is saying or joking about being a bold woman or male or the bride, is this person meaning this in a bad way or is it just a way of talking or there are lots of things that that I could talk about or, or take into consideration but what I wanted to know was their reality how right. do right. they think right. and of course I will I totally agree there is what I, I refer to as the white male syndrome the positive stereotyping of the white male and as I mean, which is really lacking in postcolonial feminism, where I criticize my, my uh, postcolonial feminism of why are these women not finding men in the home countries attractive? I mean, it's a reality. I mean, Mohanty talks about that, that women, um, that men are generalized uh, in the third world country and women are also generalized, but these women, as I mentioned, are also stereotyping men from the home country. And how do we move away from that? And it's their reality, what they are talking about, and why are they stereotyping men in the home country? So I think that's a, a quite a complex discussion as well. So yeah, there's a generalization as well here with why the white male, it's also again colonial time, history, and TV and soap opera, which one woman told me that she watched movies and this is what this kind of life that she wanted to. And then when she moved here yeah, and got married, it was totally different. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. So the final one, the kind one. <laughs> um, so, in your own words, you did this work, you worked for three, three years wrote your ass off probably uh, trying 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 to compile this this uh, this this bunk of material and 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 make it readable which it is which it is um, so your thesis in your words how does that contribute to the fairer society mm. uh, as we see it today yeah i would say that as we don't have um integration politics, that is a huge contribution actually. And also understanding women, understanding where they are from without homogen homogenization and without seeing them as just a group of women and referring to just a woman, but giving them an agency as well. They, of course, it's difficult when they come here without a history. It's a small society when we can relate to each other and having a history. And it's quite difficult for a foreign foreigner, no matter who, moving to a small scale society and not having any history with him or her. These person or these women are being related to or seen through the person they are married to. And this is the purpose of this, of this thesis, to give these women a um, voice and to show that they are different dynamics in those couples. Thank you. So, here we are, <laughs> Verona, approaching the end of a long session. And I have the honor of being the one following the, the first opponents to have the last word together with you. Uh, at the same time, I have to say that uh, Quite a few of my questions have already been discussed, <laughs> so I'll, I might make it a bit short. Um, so first of all, I want to 
um, try to sum up with some general observations, comments. And then I have a few questions. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for, for this interesting, exciting uh, project and, and uh, the talk so far today. Um, I can say that uh, you're a pioneer in research in this area. Uh, it's the first study of its kind in the pharaohs and about the pharaohs. So the, the female non-European migrants to the pharaohs is a, it's a new area, new topic. And uh, as been mentioned earlier, it, it also puts name on the nameless and exposes a group that has been quite hidden in the pharaohs. And also, I think, uh, if you look at the families, because all these women are parts of family networks, family groups, it's a very much larger group than most people think. Mm -hmm. If you count the husbands, the children, mother-in-laws, sister-in-laws, etc. And many of them are maybe also a bit silent. Mm. So, um, so this comprehensive uh, ethnographic research project offers answers to some of the questions about international migration in urgent need to be dealt with in contemporary Faroe society, as we have already discussed, among academics as well as uh, policymakers. I would also say that uh, your uh, work contributes to growing scholarship on migration. Uh, first of all, uh, so-called marriage migration in um, rural or, or coastal or whatever you choose to call it, communities in the Nordic region. I also feel that your project fits, fits well into the, the, the profile of the Department of History and Social Science mm -hmm. here, which you've been part of, and where, for example, Erika Hayfield has also been engaged in, in social research focusing on, the, on new Faroe Islanders who have background from non-European countries. <coughs> so, as an anthropologist, I welcome this movement in our research community which not only provides us with knowledge about the narratives and feelings, life, world, and identities of women moving to the pharaohs, but also about ourselves. Our ways of creating boundaries and bridges between us and them, um, which I think is, is uh, uh, one of the very interesting perspectives in your work. And, um, and you have rich and diverse material from different countries, and um, you have already uh, given us the answer of why you decide to take the whole of Africa <laughs> as one group, which was one of my <laughs> comments in red, red color. 1.3 billion inhabitants <laughs> and uh, 54 countries and a few thousand ethnic groups. <laughs> uh, but you have defended that choice well. Um, and this is, of course, also about the um, challenge, always, about saying uh, who is less or who is more different mm. than the other. <coughs> the question about uh, the difference that makes the difference, as Gregory Bateson puts it. You could maybe say that in the pharaohs, the dominant image is that the Danes are the least alien, mm. thereafter the Nordic people, and thereafter maybe Northern Europe, and then the rest of Europe, and then the rest of the world. So you have different layers mm. defining the otherness. And um, so I think the the this the. the um, Looking at the discussions that have been this afternoon and, and the written work, the strength and potential of the uh, study is the solid foundation based on this uh, empirical material and relevant theoretical concepts and discussions 
uh, that gives the reader a comprehension of the complex, mm. the very complex and multifaceted nature of this topic, of the marriage migration's influence on the lives of women marrying to the pharaohs. So from this, uh, from this uh, starting comments, I, I want to go further to some questions. The first one is about, it has already been discussed uh, thoroughly about uh, prejudices and, and stereotyping, so maybe I'll jump over it at least as a start. Uh, then I have another question um, or inquiry that you could maybe, uh, a topic that you, can, you could elaborate on. So family is a key concept and institution in this project and, and we can see and we learn that these women uh, moving to the pharaohs become members of families uh, all over the country, in small village communities, in towns, in the capital. And, um, uh, well, maybe small and big uh, family networks and uh, with husbands with very different positions in the labor market, etc. So it's a small island or small scale island society uh, which is quite homogeneous according to your mm. definition but which has many uh, societal groups. So the question is, uh, are women from Asian and African countries marrying Faroese men from uh, let's say middle class families in Torshavn in the same situation as the women marrying Faroese men from working class families in towns or smaller villages. Um, do they face the same prejudices or the same patterns of discrimination regardless of their husband's position or situation or cultural status? In other words, is the othering process undifferentiated in the Faroese society? Could you Hmm. Reflect on that topic. <clears throat> yeah. Um, as I mentioned in the thesis, it's not all of them who have experienced stereotyping. Some of them told me that they have never uh, experienced anything negative here. And what I found out, it's, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't mean anything if you're living in Toshan or in small villages. I mean, if I have to focus on the four couple interviews I have made. I mean, two of them were, three of them were from villages and one of them in Toshan. And two of the men, one, the one in Toshan and one in a small village had the same level of education. And two of the other, others from the small villages had also the same level of education. And they were academics, actually. So um, I would say that it depends, again, on the intersection of upbringing as well and age as well, because some of them, two of them, were 50 years up and had quite young wives. And their perception of what a good marriage is or how to negotiate couples was quite different from the other ones. And even though this, those two, who, the one in Toshan and the one in, in the small village had the same level of education, they had totally different perception as well. Sorry, but I forgot your question. Was it about uh, the marriage self or about uh, stereotyping or about how they perceive themselves. Stereotyping, mostly, yeah, and yeah, prejudices. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not all of them who lived in Toshan have experienced stereotyping, and most of my respondents were from Toshan actually, because it was them who wanted to talk to me, and okay. uh, around four or five was uh, were from other villages, and. Those from the villages, they, yeah, they, all of them have experienced um, being stereotyped as women because they come from small places. 
uh, in the uh, he living in small places here, where maybe there are not so many migrants living, and the husband has uh, been asked as well. One of the husband told me that he was asked by a neighbor, "Why did you buy a woman from from specific places?" You know, and are you having a wife here just to take care of yourselves? You know, they, there are all those kind of of discussions or, 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 stereo or, or discourses going on where, where some locals find themselves allowed to, to, to ask about those things. But I think that as a researcher as well, we, I mean, I have the plan of maybe later on to take this further with a Faroese perspective. Mm -hmm. How? I mean, if the Faroese people are really meaning those things or what what, what do they mean by that? You know, if it is, are they really looking down on, this, on, on, on these women, or is it just a way of talking? You know, so these. I mean, with this thesis, I wanted to have the women's perspective, their, their lived realities. But if I take it from another perspective, so maybe I will have another story. Mm. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Exactly. And even if you would make a new project mm -hmm. with Faris families, you would it would you would still have these questions as kind of generalizations yeah. because of yeah. course uh, it, not everyone is uh, taking part in this. Okay. Um, now I have a. Another question which is maybe a bit more tricky or maybe off the track <laughs> and you can, you can try to answer if you like to, otherwise we will jump over it. Uh, so, um, you can say it, I would like to give this discussion a, a twist turning at the image of the Faroe Islands as context around here. Mm. <coughs> so, in, in, in your thesis, the read, uh, reader is guided through um, um, interesting discussions from gender theory, post-colonial femi feminism, and uh, Bourdieu's theory of practice. And uh, the binary rich-poor and north-south dichotom uh, dichotomies of regions and countries are critically reviewed. And the transition from one of these worlds to the other is analyzed uh, as the performance of upwards or, or downward uh, mobility, you could say. Uh, the not particularly romantic term of hypergamy, <laughs> <laughs> meaning marrying up, <laughs> in this case through marriage migration, is for instance uh, used to cast uh, suspicion on the, the, the real mm. intentions of women marrying a local man in the north. But what is the north? The Faroe Islands are wealthy and modern. Sure, at least wealthy. But how does the colonial and political history but how does the colonial and political history of the pharaohs influence the pharaoh's encounter with the stranger? Mm. Uh, could, it be, could it be that the pharaoh's othering of non-Europeans, in this case uh, women, in one way or the other, is something that we, so to speak, uh, learned from Denmark and Europe? In other words, could we say that the general Degradation of foreign women in the pharaohs, as described and explained in different examples in the project, is a way for Faroe Islanders to symbolically upgrade their status against people that they feel or used to feel devaluated by. Mm. Do we feel more modern and powerful by emphasizing the backwardness mm. of non-Western foreigners? Do you have any, um. any thoughts about that? <laughs> I would say, what is backwardness? Excuse me? <laughs> what is backwardness? Yeah, and in, in, uh, the, in quotation marks. Exactly. Uh, that yeah. they are uh, primitive yeah, or, or not yeah, modern I know, or I know, traditional. but I'm just, I'm just asking myself, what yeah. is backwardness, yeah, exactly. you know? And uh, of course, there's a colonial uh, relationship with Faroe Islands and Denmark and Greenland as well. And uh, the relationship, what I... I have been told between Faroe Islands and Greenland is quite colonial as well. 
where within the sailing industry, um, who is doing what on, on, on a boat, on a ship? So it's uh, on the vessel ship. So it's, it's also the hierarchy of Faroese people and Greenlandic people on working, working places. I mean, on, on, on the labor market, where we can see Faroese people working as directors and so on in, in Greenland. So, um, yes, I would definitely say there is the colonialism going on here and the construction of the other by this way. But Faroe Islands is, is, is a modern society with that. I would say Toshan, especially with cafes and, 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 and cultural events and so on. But if you look at the uh, discussions going on, especially on Facebook and social media, about Muslim people, about refugees, it's very much on a Danish perspective. Because we are not confronted with refugees in the Faroe Islands. We don't have, we have very few Muslim people living here in the Faroe Islands. But there are really strong stereotyping of who these people are. So I would say that our perspective may be come, would definitely come from, from Denmark, where this othering is going on and who is the good guy and who is the bad guy without us being confronted with, with those situations yet. And our politicians as well are taking up those discussions with refugee and Muslims and who is allowed to come here and who is not allowed to come here. So um, maybe I think that we reflect, Faroese people is reflecting themselves through a Danish perspective. And it's, 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 it's uh, normal, if I will say, because of the colonial relationships. There are plenty of, plenty of shopping malls and coffee shops in Nairobi. Yeah. And in Bangkok. Yes. And in Manila. Yeah, of course. And they, they probably feel that their city it's yeah. much bigger and more yeah. cosmopolitan and, and those more women, modern yeah. than Toshan. Yeah. So yeah, those women think that Toshan is not modern at all. Mm. And this is what is really interesting in those interviews. They think that Faroe Islands is really backwards. In their mind, Faroe Islands is really backwards. Because they are from big cities and they have been working, many of them have been working in international companies. So for them, mm -hmm. moving here was not, the, I mean, First of all, they didn't really know what Faroe Island was about. This is the danger of it. Yeah. They thought that the Faroe Islands was Denmark, was like Denmark. And then afterwards, when they moved to the Faroe Islands, seeing reality was something else. So, um, so yeah, I mean, modernity for them was something totally different yeah. compared to what mm. is here. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, we can discuss further yes. <laughs> later, we'll have time. Uh, I think uh, we, sh we should try to, <laughs> to sum up. So my, my last, uh, I think, maybe the last questions, <laughs> question is more about um, future research uh, yeah. possibilities and, and uh, also methodology. So, um, yeah, so these women, um, no, no, excuse me, this one, yeah. Uh, that are in focus in, in your research. Uh, they come to the Faroe Islands from, from other continents and to, as, as, as it might feel for them, a small faraway island community. And, uh, but most of them keep contact or, or, or bonds or relations to their, to their native or mm. their home uh, country and their family and friends. And, uh, and you have information, uh, diverse, rich information through the interviews about that. Uh, you can say a geographical and also a, a, a time-wise uh, uh, difference, another uh, temporal uh, part of their life hmm. before they came to the Pharaohs. But you hear them talking and explaining while they are already here and trying to adapt. So uh, I think that this project, or in future projects, could profit from multi-sided 
ethnography. Mm. And many anthropologists and ethnologists and other researchers engaged in similar research on, on migrant families or diaspora groups, they use multi-sided ethnographies in order to, to, to like um, map mm. or, or follow the roots mm. of the, the participants in their projects, visiting the places that some of yep. the participants have been to. And of course, it can be also a complex venture. Some of the women have maybe lived in another country, a third country in Europe, mm. for a few or many years. Mm -hmm. and, and they have maybe parents living in a fourth country, mm. etc. Yeah. So it's also a question of globalization, a globalizing world. So my question is, uh, do you think it would be a good uh, idea in, in if you had the time and the resources to, to visit some of these places that the women talk about? And, and um, uh, do you have any ideas of what, it could, what could be the contribution? Yeah, absolutely. I think life trajectories looking at the past, past life before migration is always interesting uh, in relations to what they are telling me as well. I mean, if I have to, an when analyzing also what they think of the new life, I think the old life is also interesting to, to look at. And also the family relations as well uh, in their home community and uh, how was it for the, how was it to be women in their community and what are they talking about when they talk about hegemonic masculinity and so on so the 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 the, the relations among individuals here would have been really interesting to to do an ethnographic work i i believe it would have been really interesting yeah do you think do you think that those images or or narratives about uh hegemonic masculinity or, or this uh, dominant masculinity in their home mm. country would have been the same if you had been there and see their environment or do you, or do you think that is also influenced by their, mm. their, the fact that they are already in some way they are moved away and they have mm. I an mean, identity they, that they, their perspective was the reason for why they chose marriage, migration, was because of hegemonic masculinity. Yeah, yeah. And some of them, three of them were divorced women and then mm. remarried to the Faroe Islands. And they didn't, I mean, other than they couldn't find a husband there, they didn't find the man as attractive as well because they, say, they told me that as highly educated women, I was, I mean, also the fact that so many of them had an education is also something to think about. Who was those women who wanted to speak to me as well? What about those who maybe don't have an education, you know? What are their, their perspective of, of, of gender and family and so on? So this is something that I have to think about as well, that who wanted to speak to me and who didn't want to speak to me? So definitely, I mean, I can't say what they mean, I, mean, I didn't ask them what they mean by hegemonic masculinity, but what I understood was cheating and having different kind of gender roles for men and women, which is allowed and not allowed, and which they didn't find attractive as, as women. Thank you very much. Then I think uh, I will just uh, give you some uh, general suggestions. Yeah that I think we, we, we agree on in, in the committee, is that uh, this, um, this, this work deserves to get back to not only to the ivory tower of the academics, but also to a broader public. So we would really um, recommend that you try to maybe write uh, uh, summaries to, to newspapers or, or and also also to go back to your uh, participants mm. with with your yeah your book mm -hmm. yeah and uh, if, if they read it uh, that's up to them but it would be a very very nice gesture and um, and of course uh, and I know that that you that you are um, um, 
thinking about it yourself is also to, 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 to communicate uh, and you share your knowledge with the policymakers and, mm. the, and the political establishment. So I think, I think that was my last comments. So uh, do you have anything you would like to add? I would just end? like to thank you all for being part of, um, of this process. It has been three long years with ups and downs and uh, reaching here today, it's a huge achievement for me. I would like to thank my supervisors, both of them are here today. They have been really <laughs> been with me through the whole thing. And also my family, my husband and and my colleagues as well. <laughs> so um, yes, I, um, I'm really uh, thankful that um, I received grant from our um, research, um, how do you call that? Research uh, community? Um, Council. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that they believed in me and they believed in the project and now it's done and the result is here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Shall I say it myself? Okay. Uh, now, uh, uh, the, the committee, assessment committee, will go out to a special meeting room and we will make our conclusion. I'll come back. Thank you.
också. Jag vet inte om vi väntar. All right, so uh, we are back. And I, I will just read a small part or, or a part of the, of the final assessment of Runa Priti Isfeld's project. Uh, so, um, during the defense, uh, Runa engaged in a reflexive, reflective dialogue with the committee. It's our view that Runa demonstrates convincing empirical, methodological and theoretical understandings of various aspects related to her research field. She demonstrates that the topic of marriage, migration and, chal uh, and challenges related to processes of inclusion and exclusion is a theme of high relevance to the Faroe Islands. The committee hereby recommends that Runa Priti Isfeld is awarded the PhD degree. Congratulations. Yeah, on behalf of the University of the Faroe Islands, I want to thank the assessment committee for well done job and for a very interesting defense. And for me, it's left to congratulate you, Runa, for the PhD uh, title and to award you this diploma from the university. Så kommer du lyckas se att orgefrukt, vi snackar vill se en ägare till Runo, och annars så är APT här med